In the realm of manga and anime, few names resonate as powerfully as Rumiko Takahashi, renowned for her imaginative storytelling, quirky characters, and unparalleled ability to weave narratives that transcend cultural boundaries, Takahashi stands as a titan in the world of Japanese pop culture. To comprehend the genesis of her creativity, we delve into the early chapters of her life, exploring the formative years that shaped the artistic genius we know today. Rumiko Takahashi was born on October 10, 1957 in Niigata, Japan, in a family that embraced the tranquility of provincial life in balance with the advantages offered by the nearby city. Raised in a middle-class household, she spent her formative years surrounded by the scenic landscapes and traditional customs of Niigata. Her childhood, while seemingly ordinary, bore the seeds of creativity that would later bloom into a prolific career. The place where I grew up was a surprisingly nice place. The surroundings were a bustling and vibrant city. There were lots of artists and shimsen masters. There was a good amount of willows, and one out of every ten buildings was a shrine. My parents were a normal married couple who got along, and that was really good for me. For example, if I had to draw someone evil, I wasn't able to. I drew villains while thinking of things like, I may consider him oblivious, but they are still basically a good guy. For me, it's impossible to like an evil character. That may be an influence for my parents as well. When I was a child, I was scolded by them a lot, but it seems that I gradually became an adult. As the daughter of a physician, I was never really wealthy or poor. My parents weren't strict. Regarding my education, my family always insisted that I would at least finish college. Takahashi's introduction to the world of storytelling was marked by the traditional Japanese art of kumishibai, or paper theatre. In this age-old form of entertainment, illustrated boards were used to narrate stories to eager audiences, captivating young minds with tales of folklore and adventure. This early exposure ignited Takahashi's passion for narrative, planting the seeds for her future endeavours. As television emerged as a powerful medium in post-war Japan, Takahashi found herself captivated by the animated world that unfolded on the screen. Shows like Astro Boy and Doraemon became her companions, offering glimpses into fantastical realms that fueled her burgeoning imagination. The impact of these early anime experiences on Takahashi's creative psyche cannot be overstated, as they showed the desire to craft stories that transcended the ordinary. Takahashi's family played a pivotal role in nurturing her creative spirit. While her parents encouraged her artistic pursuits, her brother, who shared a love for manga, introduced her to the medium that would later become the canvas for her storytelling prowess. The Takahashi household thus became a crucible for creativity, where the seeds of ambition were sown in the fertile soil of familial support. I would say I was a reserved child. I didn't like sports. I was angry when I was told to play outside during cold weather. The school I attended was distant. It was about 20 to 30 minutes on foot, and I could hardly make friends with the children in that neighborhood. My parents told me all the time to go outside and play, but there were lots of times where I ended up drawing at home. I have two brothers, and the first one to tell me to draw manga was my older brother, who is working as a doctor nowadays. Watch Sazisan. The key for manga is the four-panel scheme. He was telling me all sorts of nonsense to draw. Since at the time I was a fan of Fujio Akatsuka, the first manga I drew was a four-panel which featured Osomatsu and the princess. Now that I think about it, that brother of mine was the one who made me a manga artist. Takahashi's academic journey saw her attending Niigata Chuo High School, where her passion for storytelling continued to flourish. Her love for manga and anime persisted, with her creations gaining recognition among classmates and teachers alike. The supportive environment of her school years became another stepping stone in the evolution of her artistic identity. Takahashi's teenage years were characterized by a burning desire to transform her passion for storytelling into a lifelong vocation. Fueling the ambition was the indomitable spirit that often accompanies adolescence, the period where dreams take root and ambitions sprout wings. In this phase, Takahashi began to envision a future where her narratives would captivate the hearts and minds of readers worldwide. Of course, I didn't like studying one bit, especially with math, where my scores were low, as well as with fractions where I failed at the speed of light. I could barely pass Japanese language, English, and history. I attended a girls' high school, but us three friends, we created a manga lab. However, we didn't know what to do. For school festivals, we used to print copies with a mimeograph. We distributed them, and we asked people what they thought of them. I used to copy drawings of Spider-Man. At the time, I was a fan of Ryoichi Ikigami. Her journey into the world of manga took a definitive shape during her high school years, where she honed her artistic skills and experimented with various storytelling techniques. The halls of Niigata Chuo High School became witness to the birth of characters and plots that hinted at the genius awaiting fruition. The guidance of supportive teachers and camaraderie among fellow aspiring artists fostered an environment where Takahashi's creative prowess blossomed. 
Takahashi's teen years coincided with the rise of the Gekiga movement, an avant-garde approach to manga that delved into darker and more mature themes. While this movement influenced many contemporaries, Takahashi charted her own course, blending elements of Gekiga with her distinct narrative flair. The reason why I first submitted to Shonen Magazine was because I wanted to draw Shonen manga so badly. I think it was due to the manga I read while I was growing up. However, regarding Shonen Sunday, I always read it with pleasure since my first year in school. I was hooked on Otoko Dao Koshien, and I fell in love with the protagonists of Ashita no Jo and Judo Ichokusen. In my first story, everyone has been infected by bacteria, and they can't die no matter what. This leads to a mess where a salaryman and a student duel against one another. When I say this now, I cannot see it in my head, so, as a result, I don't feel convinced about it. It is not possible to draw something you cannot explain clearly. This happens because that happens. Also, it kills me that I drew comedy manga with the serious style of Ikigami Sensei, and so, logically, it was not chosen. No one thinks that their work will be rejected when you submit it, so in that moment it was a shock. Because of the failure, I gave up on my dream of becoming a pro. I thought that I would live all my life in Niigata working as a boring secretary. My father scolded me by saying a punk like you not even helping at home must experience how tough independent life is, go to Tokyo, and it was decided that I would be enrolled into college. The transition to college marked a crucial juncture in Takahashi's journey. Opting to attend Nihon University College of Art in Tokyo, she immersed herself in an environment that exposed her to a broader spectrum of artistic influences. The bustling metropolis, with its vibrant cultural scene, injected fresh inspiration into her creative veins. Tokyo became the canvas upon which Takahashi painted the next chapters of her artistic odyssey. Adolescence is often a tumultuous time, marked by personal challenges that shape one's character. For Takahashi, the untimely death of her father became a poignant chapter that added layers to her storytelling. The emotional depth she drew from this experience would later resonate in the nuanced portrayals of familial bonds that became a hallmark of her works. During her university years, Rumiko Takahashi found herself drawn into the captivating world of Gekiga Sonjuku a manga school founded by the esteemed Kazuo Koike, the mastermind behind works such as Lone Wolf and Cub. Within the confines of this creative sanctuary, Takahashi began to carve her path, experimenting with her artistic expressions and honing her storytelling prowess. In 1975, she took the plunge into publishing with her first doujinshi creations. The doujinshi realm served as a canvas for her early narratives, allowing her to explore the intricate art of character creation and plot development. Under Koike's mentorship, Takahashi was encouraged to delve deep into the intricacies of her characters, infusing them with substance and uniqueness. Koike's influence became a guiding light, imprinting upon Takahashi the importance of crafting engaging characters, a lesson that would echo through her illustrious career. Simultaneously, Takahashi embarked on a brief yet enriching journey as the assistant to Kazuo Umezu, a renowned horror manga artist. During this period, Umezu was engrossed in the creation of his comedic series, Makoto-chan, the experience of collaborating with Umezu provided Takahashi with valuable insights into the dynamics of different genres, expanding her artistic horizons. In the wake of her university years, Rumiko Takahashi's creative journey took a momentous turn with the inception of Kate no Yatsura, a precursor that laid the foundation for the iconic and immensely successful Urusei Yatsura. Introduced to the world in 1978, Kate no Yatsura marked Takahashi's early foray into the rom-com genre. Kate no Yatsura, with its whimsical charm and endearing characters, served as a testing ground for Takahashi's storytelling acumen. The success of this early work revealed a burgeoning talent capable of crafting narratives that resonated with a wide audience. However, it was with the creation of Urusei Yatsura in 1978 that Takahashi truly catapulted herself into the limelight, forever altering the landscape of manga. Oh, can I really become a professional? That was so touching. That was something similar to being accepted. I decided I was going to make my debut, but I was not able to make it for a while. That was so disgraceful to me. I was telling myself all the time that it would be a shame if I didn't do it soon, so I drew Kate no Yatsura during the spring break between my second and third year of college. I sent off the originals, and then sometime later the editorial department contacted my residence out of the blue, and the editor asked, would you like to do work as the assistant to a professional manga artist? I thought there must be a reason for a call like this, and yes, it cannot be something bad. Yes, it has to be something good. Urusei Yatsura emerged as a cultural phenomenon, captivating readers with its unique blend of romantic entanglements, extraterrestrial elements, and comedic brilliance. The series, which followed the misadventures of hapless Ataru Moroboshi and his companion, the lovable alien Lum, became an instant hit, and marked the onset of the rom-com boom within the manga industry. 
Takahashi's ability to seamlessly intertwine romance, comedy, and elements of science fiction struck a chord with readers, transcending cultural boundaries. The success of Urusei Yatsura not only propelled Takahashi to the zenith of manga stardom, but also paved the way for the rom-com genre to flourish. The series' popularity spurred a wave of romantic comedies in the manga and anime realms, solidifying Takahashi's influence and reshaping the trajectory of the genre for years to come. The whimsical and relatable nature of Takahashi's characters, coupled with her skillful narrative craftsmanship, turned Urusei Yatsura into a cultural touchstone. Its impact resonated not only in Japan but across the globe, garnering an international fanbase. Urusei Yatsura is a work that I wanted to do so much. As the title says, it seems I kinda stumbled upon it. I like sci-fi, but this work of mine is not really science fiction. It's just a funny idea. It can be considered a funny idea coming from a trend but it has the flexibility to be drawn as I fancy, like sci-fi. I thought sometimes that I wish I could fly in the sky or teleport myself if I was late to an appointment without thinking of the consequences. I was able to freely draw things like that because Yurisei Yatsura took a kind of flexibility from sci-fi. The reason why I wanted to draw a comedy manga was due to the fact that readers would react quickly. If I saw somebody laughing while reading it, I would say Yahoo, I made them laugh. It's plain to see. If it was a serious story, the reader would say, aha, aha, and it wouldn't let the feelings of the reader show. It's like the psychology of a child who wants an immediate reward. Takahashi's commitment to meticulous detail became evident in her character designs and backgrounds early on. Each panel of her manga reflected a careful consideration of composition and visual harmony. Her characters were not merely vessels for the narrative, but intricate personas with distinctive traits and emotions. Whether capturing the serene beauty of rural landscapes or the vibrant chaos of urban life, Takahashi's art pulsed with an exquisite attention to detail. What set Takahashi apart was her ability to convey a spectrum of emotions through her character's expressions. From the comedic exaggeration of facial features in humorous scenes to the nuanced subtlety of emotional moments, her characters were a testament to the versatility of her artistic skill. This fluidity in expression not only added depth to her storytelling but also established a profound connection between the characters and readers. Takahashi's artistry extended beyond static visuals to innovative storytelling techniques. She employed dynamic panel layouts and pacing that heightened the narrative tension. The seamless integration of action and dialogue showcased a mastery of visual storytelling, captivating readers and immersing them in the unfolding worlds she crafted. Through her art, she invited readers on a visual journey that transcended the confines of the page. Right now, I think I've reached the point where I always wanted to be at. That's why I don't have any desire to do anything else. I have an environment where I can draw manga without having to worry about eating. I feel like I'm lucky enough to have some money, so I have no ambition to do anything with it. The act of shopping may be a good way to relieve your stress, but going to a department store can be tiring and frustrating. Amidst the resounding success of Urusei Yatsura, Rumiko Takahashi continued to diversify her portfolio, showcasing her versatility as a storyteller. One of her notable creations during the 1980s was the manga series Maison Ikuoku, which made its debut in 1980. Departing from the extraterrestrial themes of her previous work, Maison Ikoku unfolded a poignant romantic tale set within the confines of a boarding house. The series revolved around the lives of its eccentric residents, exploring themes of love, perseverance, and personal growth. Takahashi's narrative finesse manifested in the nuanced portrayal of characters grappling with the complexities of relationships, set against the backdrop of humor and relatable human experiences. Maison Ikoku not only solidified Takahashi's reputation as a master of romantic storytelling, but also garnered critical acclaim for its depth and emotional resonance. With Maison Ikoku, I felt as if I rolled a ball of yarn. Following a certain order, things happen so I must respond like that, and so on. On the other side, Urusei Yatsura was like throwing a rugby ball. You don't know in what way it will come back, because you've done this or that and it can't be helped. But, if you don't treat it like a rugby ball, where you don't know how it will bounce, then the manga doesn't take shape. It's impossible if the ideas and the development don't change in the next panel. It's like saying that there isn't a single thread connecting the introduction and the climax. At that point, it was hard to think which were the elements I should use to make the reader wonder about what is happening next after so many inconceivable things have happened. Simultaneously, Takahashi showed her storytelling prowess through a variety of short stories that delved into diverse genres, from supernatural elements in Fire Tripper to the exploration of human condition in One or W. Each short story was a testament to her ability to navigate different thematic landscapes. These standalone narratives provided a canvas for Takahashi to experiment with storytelling techniques, captivating readers with tales that ranged from whimsical to the introspective. As the 1980s progressed, Takahashi continued to expand her creative horizons, venturing into darker and fantastical realms with Mermaid Saga. Serialized from 1984 to 1994, this series explored the haunting consequences of immortality and the supernatural allure of mermaids. 
Takahashi's ability to seamlessly blend horror elements with compelling character development showcased her narrative dexterity, earning Mermaid Saga a dedicated fanbase. In 1987, Takahashi introduced another groundbreaking series that would further solidify her legacy, Ranma Half. This unique blend of martial arts, comedy, and gender-bending themes followed the misadventures of Ranma Saotome, a martial artist cursed to transform into a girl whenever splashed with cold water. The series not only introduced innovative comedic elements, but also challenged traditional gender roles, offering a fresh perspective on identity and relationships. Ranma Half became another cultural phenomenon, captivating audiences with its dynamic characters, innovative plotlines, and humorous take on societal norms. Takahashi's ability to infuse social commentary into her narratives, all while maintaining a light-hearted tone, further solidified her reputation as a trailblazer in the manga industry. Rumiko Takahashi's indelible mark on in the anime and manga industry stems from her progressive and innovative approach to character writing. As a visionary storyteller, Takahashi redefined the narrative landscape, introducing characters that broke away from traditional tropes and resonated with audiences on a profound level. Perhaps most groundbreaking is Takahashi's challenge to traditional gender roles and societal norms through her character portrayals. In Urusei Yatsura, she introduced Lum, an extraterrestrial character who defined conventional expectations of female characters in manga. Lum's assertiveness and agency were a departure from passive female archetypes prevalent at the time, signaling a shift towards more empowered and diverse representations. The progressive spirit continued with Ranma Half, where Takahashi explored gender-bending themes through the protagonist Ranma Saotome. The series not only provided a fresh perspective on identity and relationships, but also challenged societal expectations surrounding gender roles. By tackling these themes with humor and sensitivity, Takahashi demonstrated the transformative power of manga to influence cultural conversations. Rumiko Takahashi's influence extended beyond the pages of manga, as her iconic works found new life in the realm of anime. The transition from manga to animated series brought her stories to a broader audience, both within Japan and internationally. In the case of Urusei Yatsura, the success of the manga was mirrored by its anime adaptation. Airing from 1981 to 1986, the animated series captured the essence of Takahashi's comedic and romantic genius, bringing the misadventures of Atoru Muraboshi and Lam to life on the small screen. The animated adaptation not only retained the charm of the manga, but also introduced Takahashi's storytelling to a wider audience, solidifying her status as a household name in the world of anime. Similarly, Maison Ikeoku received its own anime adaptation, premiering in 1986 and running until 1988. The animated series faithfully portrayed the romantic nuances and comedic elements of Takahashi's original work, allowing viewers to immerse themselves in the heartfelt narrative of boarding house residents. The success of the Maison Ikeoku anime further cemented Takahashi's ability to captivate audiences across different mediums. As the 1980s unfolded, Takahashi's influence continued to expand with anime adaptations of her other works. Ranma Half, one of Takahashi's most beloved series, not only enjoyed a successful manga run, but also became an anime sensation. Airing from 1989 to 1992, the animated adaptation skillfully brought life to the comedic chaos surrounding Ranma Saotome's gender transformations. The quirky characters and humorous scenarios translated seamlessly to the animated format, captivating a new generation of fans. Urusei Yatsura lasted for 34 volumes, and Maison Ikuoku has a length of 15 volumes. Altogether, they sold over 20 million copies. It is not wrong to say that they were big hit and representative works of a certain era, and with anime contrasting what the author has imagined, you see yourself transported to another world. I'm sorry to say this, but I think TV is even more incredible in being able to do that. I feel frustrated about that, but I will say that the television series was one of the reasons it was able to transform into movies as well. That was also incredible. In addition to her prior works in anime, Rumiko Takahashi continued to leave an indelible mark on the anime landscape with her involvement in another iconic series during the 1990s. Inuyasha, premiering in 2000 and based on her equally successful manga starting in 1996, Inuyasha combined elements of historical fantasy, action, and romance, creating a narrative tapestry that resonated with audiences globally. Inuyasha followed the adventures of Kagome Higurashi, a modern-day high school girl transported to the Sengoku period of Japan. There, she encounters the half-demon Inuyasha, and together with a diverse group of characters, they embark on a quest to collect the shards of the powerful Shikon Jewel. The series showcased Takahashi's ability to weave intricate plotlines, melding fantastical elements with character-driven storytelling. The success of Inuyasha solidified Takahashi's reputation as a creator capable of crafting narratives that spanned multiple genres. The series' compelling characters, including the titular half-demon Inuyasha, the strong-willed Kagame, and the enigmatic Seshumaro became enduring symbols in the anime and manga world. 
The blend of action, romance, and supernatural elements appealed to a broad audience, cementing Takahashi's legacy in the pantheon of anime greats. Throughout the 1990s and 2000s, Rumiko Takahashi's creative output remained prolific, and her influence extended beyond the boundaries of traditional manga and anime. Her ability to create relatable characters and craft stories with universal themes ensured that her works continued to captivate audiences across generations. Beyond Inuyasha, Takahashi's diverse portfolio included other notable contributions. Rumik Theater, an anthology series of short stories, allowed her to explore a range of genres, from comedy to drama, showcasing the depth and versatility of her storytelling. The series ran from 1994 to 2019 and provided a platform for Takahashi to experiment with narrative structures and themes. As the years progressed, Takahashi continued to explore the anime landscape with adaptations of her later works. Rene, a supernatural comedy manga serialized from 2009 to 2017, received an anime adaptation that further demonstrated Takahashi's enduring appeal. The series, blending elements of the supernatural with humor, added another chapter to her illustrious career. In reflecting on Rumiko Takahashi's impact on the anime and manga industry, it becomes evident that her influence goes beyond individual series. Her storytelling transcends cultural and generational boundaries resonating with audiences worldwide, whether exploring the complexities of relationships, delving into the supernatural, or challenging societal norms, Takahashi's narratives continue to stand the test of time. Rumiko Takahashi has embarked on another captivating journey with her latest series, Mao. Serialized in Shoga Kukan's weekly Shonen Sunday magazine, since May 2019, the series spans 18 Tankobon volumes as of November 2023 and Viz Media has secured the English licensing for the North American audience. Mao delves into the mysterious tale of Nano Kakiba, transported to Japan's Taisho period after a chance discovery at the Gogyo Town Shopping Center. There, she encounters the equally mysterious Mao in a ghost-inhabited village. Together, they unravel the peculiar events around them, with Nanoka piecing together memories of an accident eight years prior. Takahashi's storytelling finesse promises an enthralling blend of mystery, time travel, and supernatural intrigue in the latest addition to her impressive repertoire. Rumiko Takahashi's journey from the tranquil landscapes of Niigata to the bustling metropolis of Tokyo is an odyssey that mirrors the expansive worlds she crafted in her manga and anime. Her formative years, marked by the influence of traditional storytelling and early exposure to animated wonders, set the stage for a creative genius to blossom. The foundation of family support, the enriching years in Niigata Chuo High School, and the pivotal mentorship under Kazuo Koike collectively shaped Takahashi's artistic identity. All of the steps are fun, from drawing after creating the storyboard to reading it as a whole when the volume is complete. I may find it hard at times as well, but I enjoy those times too. When there are parts that become more and more difficult as I draw them, that is fun too. Manga is really fun. That's why in Yurase Yatsura and Maison Ikoku, as in Ranma Hoth, the central theme is about love. I think that being happy is key. I want to keep drawing happy endings. I want to keep drawing manga that people remember being great to reread after they finish. As the years unfolded, Takahashi's prolific output continued with the continuation of Rumik Theatre and her series Mao, which is still in its infancy. Her ability to navigate diverse genres while maintaining a universal appeal speaks to the timelessness of her narratives. Rumiko Takahashi's impact on the anime and manga landscape is not confined to individual series but reverberates through the echoes of her storytelling, transcending cultural and generational boundaries, leaving an indelible mark in the hearts and minds of audiences worldwide.